many as possible uh, about how to exercise their right to vote in the primary election. Um, I'm Ethan Witt, Chairman of the Board for the Richmond Chamber, and sir, on behalf of our board and our members, we want to thank you for, for your time today. Um, and we want to make sure that we're all doing our part to um, have as high of a voter turnout as possible. Um, Michael G. Adams is a native of Paducah and serves as the 77th Secretary of State. He attended public schools and was the first in his family to get a bachelor's degree. After graduating from the University of Louisville in its third class of McConnell Scholars, Michael attended Harvard Law School on low-income aid. Returning to Kentucky, Michael clerked for Chief U.S. District Judge John Habern, worked for Senator McConnell's 2002 re-election campaign, and as Deputy General Counsel to Governor Ernie Fletcher, before moving to Washington to serve as counselor, as counsel to the U.S. Deputy Attorney General in the second Bush administration. In 2007, Michael began full-time private practice in election law, first as general counsel to the Republican Governors Association, and later opening a national practice in the field. He has represented several national political committees, members of Congress, and statewide campaign efforts in all 50 states. Because of this unique election experience, Governor Bevan appointed Michael to the Kentucky State Board of Elections before being elected Secretary of State. Michael is happily married and the proud father of one daughter. So Mr. Secretary, thank you for your time and um, why don't you give us some introductory comments and then we can jump into some of the questions from our members. Well, Ethan, uh, thank you. Thank all of you so much. Uh, I'm not Haley Bradburn. That's my assistant. Uh, I'm Michael Adams, your Secretary of State and Chief Election Official. Uh, I want to thank you for putting this on. Uh, the biggest challenge I've got in this job right now is, is uh, not the logistics. It's preventing voter confusion. It's getting out the message to the electorate of what their options are to vote in this election. The fact that we've delayed the date by five weeks. Uh, the fact that we've made more options available to voters to make sure that we can keep them safe, uh, but also ensure that they get to vote. Uh, so uh, thank you for doing this. Uh, let me start with this. The most important thing I can say today, you've got less than 12 hours to request your absentee ballot, either from your clerk uh, or better yet from GoVoteKY.com. If you visit GoVoteKY.com before midnight tonight, you'll get your ballot much more quickly. Uh, that's our statewide online portal for requesting an absentee ballot. We don't just mail out ballots to the phone book. We've got a system in place to require a voter uh, demonstrate proof of identity before getting mailed a ballot. It takes about two minutes. I've done it. My wife's done it. The governor has done it. Uh, I've had many, many people from all over the state of both parties uh, contact us and, and thank us for how easy we've made this process. Uh, easy for the clerks and easy for the voters. So be sure to go to GoVoteKY.com in the next uh, 11 hours and 56 minutes and request your absentee ballot. That is the most safe and convenient way to vote. It's the way to get your ballot, vote safely at home while you're being safe at home otherwise. It's very convenient. And then instead of waiting in a long line on election day unnecessarily, just vote at home and just mail it back. Uh, there are four ways to vote in this election. Some are better than others, but let me tell you what your four options are. Number one, you can vote absentee ballot and mail it back to us. We're paying for the postage. It doesn't get any easier than that. Get your vote, uh, get your ballot uh, by applying at goavoteky.com. It'll be mailed to you in a matter of days. You'll get it, fill it out on your own time. Just make sure that you mail it back to us no later than June 23rd, which is election day. And again, we're paying for the postage. Uh, if you do vote absentee, make sure that you sign an inner envelope and an outer envelope provided to you. Uh, that's state law. That's not from me. That's state law. We have to have two signatures from the voter, not on your ballot, but on the uh, inner and outer envelope. The reason being we match those signatures against your signature of record on your driver's license or your voter registration card so we can verify your identity, and make sure someone didn't steal your vote. Uh, so you can vote that by mail. Uh, alternatively, you can request an absentee ballot and then hand deliver it to your county clerk's office. Uh, I found some voters in both parties don't trust the postal system. Uh, they want to have the personal satisfaction of hand delivering an absentee ballot, driving it in the bin the way you would vote uh, otherwise. So we've made that available in all 120 counties. We've provided them at our expense a secure drop box 
so that voters who don't want to mail in the ballot can go to the clerk's office and drop the ballot in the box. And those will be processed just like any other ballot. Again, those are absentee ballots, so they do have to have the envelopes signed before you drop those in the bin. Uh, but those are the two most easy, convenient, and safe way to vote, uh, ways to vote, safe not just for the voter, safe for the poll workers, for the county clerks, staff, uh, for other voters, is to vote absentee. There are two other ways to vote. One is you can vote right now in person. Uh, every single clerk in the state uh, starting a week ago has made early voting available in their county. Uh, all 120 counties have a location, at least one location where you can vote early. Uh, the reason that the governor and I agreed to uh, mandate this is to try to spread out the crowds on election day of people who are voting in person. We wanna have as many people not voting in person on election day as we can. And the best way to avoid that is uh, offering expanded absentee, but also offering other days to vote in person for people who insist on doing that or need to do that. Uh, so if you go to go, uh, go to sos.ky.gov, my website, there's a list of every single polling place in the state. You can find yours uh, for Madison County at that site, sos.ky.gov. Uh, you can make an appointment that's preferred. It's more convenient for you or get you in and out faster. It's also more convenient for the clerk and for other voters. Uh, so please call and make an appointment if you can. Uh, every voter in the state's been mailed a postcard with the name and the phone number of your county clerk. It may not pick up on the first ring. Our, our clerks are under siege right now with this election, but please be patient. Your call will be returned. Uh, the fourth way to vote is to vote in person on election day. Our state constitution provides for elections to be held, quote, at the polls. Uh, it even prescribes the hours for the election. They're actually in our state constitution. Uh, we respected our constitution that I took an oath to uh, by providing at least one location in every county for voters who insist on or need to vote in person on election day. So that's your right. However, voting absentee is also a right. It's also in our state constitution. Absentee voting has been in our state constitution for 75 years, uh, since 1945. And so we've got processes in place to ensure uh, that we keep your ballot secret, that we keep it secure, and that it counts like anybody else's. Uh, but again, we've not taken anyone's rights away. We provided more options, not fewer. Every voter who wants to vote in this election and is entitled to do so will be able to do so through one of four convenient methods. Well, thank you for that. And I will note for our live attendees that Sarah from our chamber staff has put in the chat section a link uh, to the secretary's website where you can go to request that ballot. And I would encourage the others who are on, if you have questions that I don't ask, um, type that in the chat and we'll do our best uh, to get you an answer to those during this conversation. Um, Mr. Secretary, very early on in COVID, um, you and Governor Bashir worked together um, to address the primary election, to move that date, and to set the parameters for, for how this would occur. Could you walk us through that process, how it unfolded, and, and what some of the key points were uh, through that negotiation? Sure. So to put this into perspective, uh, on March 9th, Monday, March 9th, I was on KET for an hour-long uh, pro uh, program talking about election law and policy, and I didn't get a single question about coronavirus and how it might impact the election, not one. And then just one week later on March 16th, I was standing next to the governor uh, in front of a, a press conference announcing that he and I had jointly agreed to exercise our mutual emergency powers to delay the election uh, by the maximum five weeks permitted by state law. That's how much things changed in the span of one week. That was the week when you had the the final four tournaments canceled and other major events canceled. That's the first week when everyone really caught on to what we were dealing with. Uh, and so the governor and I agreed in fairly short order to follow the uh, advice of the state board of elections of the county clerks across the state of both parties to delay this election. Uh, our first thought, the governor and me, uh, our first thought was maybe this thing will go away. Maybe if we delay the election from May 19th to June 23rd, the coronavirus will go away. The weather will warm up. Maybe this will just pass. That was certainly our hope. It wasn't our expectation, but we thought it might happen. Uh, the other thing that we had in mind was, well, look, if, if it doesn't pass, then we need some time to plan for contingencies, how we're gonna handle this election and keep people safe, but still ensure 
that we have a respectable turnout and we don't have a destabilized election with people disenfranchised. So the decision to delay the election was done pretty fast. There really wasn't any uh, dispute really anywhere uh, by anyone that I saw that we need to put this on hold for five weeks. Uh, other decisions about changes to make were a little harder to make. Uh, I had my laundry list and the governor had his and we spent several weeks negotiating with each other in good faith. Uh, I gave up some things, he gave up some things and we came up with a plan uh, two months before the election. And the reason we did that is uh, I wanted to avoid what happened in Wisconsin, what happened in Ohio. It's not just that you had problems in those states. The biggest problem in those states was that the rules weren't clear until literally the morning of the election. You had court challenges, uh, you had Democrats versus Republicans in court, you had branches of government suing each other, uh, you had Democrats and Republicans fighting, you had brinksmanship really up to literally the morning of the election in those states. And the rules weren't clear for the voters. And some people who would have voted in a certain method didn't vote at all because they didn't know they, th they could. The rules weren't clear. So to me, the, the biggest crisis to avoid was a lack of clarity. Uh, the biggest crisis to avoid was voter confusion. And that's why I was so inclined to work out an agreement uh, two months before the election with the governor, uh, a bipartisan agreement, stuff I liked, stuff that he didn't like, and the reason for that was made to have clarity as soon as possible for the electorate, Democrats and Republicans, both who were voting in their respective primaries, but also to show the voters that the rules weren't rigged, that I wasn't making all of the decisions, that he wasn't making all of the decisions, that this was a fair system that had both parties input on it. And so we, we came up with uh, making absentee voting easier. Again, absentee voting has been part of our law for a long, long time. In cases of illness or medical emergency, people could vote absentee. We just made that easier uh, by providing for this website, by paying for the postage for people to mail these back if they need to mail them back, uh, and other various changes to the system. One thing I want to touch on just real fast is that neither the governor nor I ever uh, willed for or dictated or even anticipated that you would have only one polling location in some of our larger counties, uh, Jefferson, Fayette, Boone, Canton, and Campbell, you got some pretty large counties that only have one location. Uh, that was done against uh, our preferences. That was not our idea. Uh, I, I've encouraged those counties to offer more locations if they can. I say if they can, and, and here's why. It's not obvious that they can. Uh, they had uh, locations cancel on them. They had poll workers cancel on them in droves. And you can't blame these folks. What, most of our uh, poll workers are senior citizens, and these are the people who, last of all, want to go volunteer for 12 hours to sit in a room with uh, thousands of people from the general public that they don't know who may or may not be healthy, may or may not be wearing masks or following uh, social distancing, and then you're going to put your most vulnerable class of citizens to coronavirus in this situation. So it's a big ask for us to get poll workers to volunteer. Uh, we made every effort we, we could. The governor and I extended the deadline twice. Uh, there's a deadline in the statute by mutual agreement. We twice extended that deadline to get more poll workers. It just wasn't enough. So I'm encouraging the counties, if they can, to add some more sites. It's not my decision uh, or the governor's. But I want to clarify, it wasn't a policy decision that he or the clerks made or I. It was a reality of just not having locations available. A lot of locations canceled for liability reasons. You, you can't blame them. A lot of them just weren't suitable because they weren't big enough to handle people six feet apart or to install plexiglass or any of that. And of course, our poll workers largely, uh, largely canceled on us. Uh, so it was a, a number of factors and we're hopeful that by providing other ways for people to vote, uh, we won't have a, di a diminution of turnout. So far, turnout is through the roof. We've actually already had more voters either already vote or request a ballot than we had uh, vote at all in the last two comparable elections. Turnout is already way above what it was when I was on the ballot last year. It's already way above what it was in the last two presidential cycles uh, for our primary. I think we're going to have higher turnout than we've had in modern times for a primary. And that's partly because people are really motivated politically right now on both sides and partly because we made it so easy to vote. Do you have a way of tracking how many of those ballots have been returned on any given date? We do. I, I don't get uh, I don't get it uh, minute by minute, but I do get regular updates from the Board of Elections. Uh, 
they get information in turn from the clerks. Uh, as, of, uh, as of yesterday, we've had over 800,000 registered Kentucky voters either already vote or request their ballot. Uh, some 700,000 have used the online portal, another 100,000 or so have used other methods of requesting an absentee ballot. And then I believe uh, maybe 15,000 or so have voted early. So you add all that up and it's, that's about 23, 22% of all registered voters. That's very high for a primary. Uh, that's higher than it was in the last couple of primaries, even if not one more voter actually votes in person for the next uh, eight days, which of course is not likely. So really, really high turnout. We're, we're tracking uh, these ballots. We don't track, of course, who someone votes for, but we do track with a barcode every outgoing and incoming absentee ballot to make sure we don't have any corruption or mistakes, lost ballots, stolen ballots, that sort of thing. Well, that brings me to a topic that was front and center in your campaign, uh, something that you touched on when you spoke to our group that was in Frankfurt several months ago, um, and that's um, protecting um, our elections. Uh, voter ID is something that you, photo ID for voters is something that you campaigned on and supported. Um, I know that that doesn't necessarily impact the mail-in ballot request process, um, but can you talk about how that will impact future elections in Kentucky and, and, and what impact you foresee that having? Sure. So the, the photo ID law that I, I ran on uh, and won on uh, and helped draft and get enacted, and actually I, I personally signed it in the law. Uh, there's a tweak I actually didn't know about in our law that if, if the governor is overridden on a veto, uh, then the bill comes to the Secretary of State to sign. I ended up signing uh, several bills of the law myself, which was pretty special. But one of them was my photo ID law. That was really special. Uh, that law takes effect for the November election. It has not taken effect yet. Uh, we considered applying it to the primary and we decided it was too soon. And I think clearly we were right. Uh, there wasn't enough time for voters to go get an ID who don't already have one. Uh, clearly with the government closed, that was gonna be impossible. So we made the right decision to, to make that effective, not for the primary, uh, but for November and going forward. Uh, to the extent in November, we have a traditional election, which is my goal, a traditional in-person election. We're gonna require people to provide a photo ID to vote. Uh, if they don't have a photo ID, they're able to vote regardless if they sign an oath that says that they meet one of certain criteria that they were literally unable to get a photo ID, and then they can vote with a non-photo ID, which is what current Kentucky law prior to my bill uh, provided for. So we've got, we've got an allowance for people who, who had not been able to get a photo ID because of the various situations here with government offices being closed. Uh, but that's gonna be the law of the land uh, effective for November and going forward is you got to bring your photo ID with you when you vote or else you're going to have to go through a different process. Uh, I want to note that my photo ID law actually applies also to mailed-in ballots. So even if uh, we're still in a situation in November where we're allowing for people to vote absentee on an expanded basis, uh, this law covers that too. Uh, this law will require people to provide a photocopy of their photo ID along with uh, their application for, uh, for an absentee ballot. So we'll still have uh, ID verification. Currently we require date of birth and social security number to get an absentee ballot, but we're gonna tighten that up even further in November with a photo ID as well. You've also talked a lot about cleaning up the voter rolls. Um, the mail-in ballot process, is, is this helpful to achieving that goal for you? And what other plans do you have down the road to continue that process? Yeah, I want to I want to clarify something for people that have uh, they've been disturbed by something that's actually good news. Uh, a lot of people I've I've heard uh, is a lot of people have received cards from the state board of elections uh, made out to voters who have died or voters who have moved away, and they're concerned this is going to enable fraud. It's actually uh, the opposite that's true. These cards are not ballots. These cards are not even requests to apply for a ballot. These are just postcards that say, "Hey, here's the new rules." Uh, when those cards are undeliverable, when the post office returns them to me because the person's not at that address or because whoever is at that address now writes on their return to sender and comes back to us. By the way, we've got a big room up to the ceiling with these postcards. Uh, we're going to get tens of thousands, potentially hundreds of thousands of them back. Here's why that's a good thing. This is, a, this is not a bug. This is a feature. I put this in my agreement with the governor for two reasons. Number one, to inform voters of the new rules, but number two, because when we get these postcards back, we can then begin the process of removing these voters 
from the roles who no longer live in our state or who have died. Uh, we've taken off uh, over 20,000 voters from the rolls since I've been sworn in. The vast, vast majority of them are simply dead. And they were on our rolls for years, even though they've been dead. Uh, I inherited a crisis in our voter rolls. A federal judge ruled against my predecessor two years ago, saying that we were out of compliance with federal and state law, that we hadn't cleaned up our rolls enough. Uh, that's an issue that I ran on and won on as well. And so we've been working very hard on that. Uh, this plan enables us to more quickly get people taken off the rolls. I don't remove anyone from the rolls without either confirmation of death that I get from the Bashir administration through their Department of Vital Statistics or a written consent from the voter who we find out has moved and then we separately contact to get consent to come off the rolls. So I don't take anyone off the rolls without their consent if they're alive. Uh, we, don't, we don't disenfranchise, we don't purge. We simply follow the process that's already required by federal and state law. And that's one of the changes that we've made since I've been sworn in. One thing that we're all accustomed to is gathering around the TV on election night and in a matter of hours, knowing the results and who the winners are, and if there are gonna be any, um, you know, any contested results or anything of that nature. How is the mail-in process going to impact the timing of, of knowing the outcome? Uh, significantly. So uh, I get this question several times a day from media. I'm getting ready to put out a formal statement, but I'll, I'll tell you basically what it is. Uh, we're not going to be able to announce statewide results on election night because there are not going to be statewide results on election night. Uh, by law, the counties get to decide how many polling locations they have. I don't get to decide that. Uh, I also don't get to decide if the counties tell me on election night what their results are. Uh, they have the right, and some of them are exercising the right to hold their results until they are final. So it may be several days. Uh, Jefferson County, Fayette County, McCracken County, I know for a fact, have already announced they're going to wait until the votes are all in before they announce their results, any of their results. Other counties are going to announce what they have when they have them. Uh, so in rural counties, in, in small counties, uh, I think most of them are going to report on election night what votes they've got in. And that kind of makes sense for them because disproportionately in the more rural counties, voting is going to be in person. And so the votes are all gonna be, not all, but largely in uh, on election night. But in the bigger counties, in, in Fayette, I think in Fayette, two thirds of the vote, maybe more will be absentee. If those are returned late, if those are mailed back the last possible day, June 23rd, then it's gonna take several days to get those ballots in the mail, let alone count them. It could take a week to count all these ballots. Other states that have gone before us in this process, uh, Wisconsin and Iowa and others, they don't have election night, they have election week. And they don't, uh, they've not reported their results until seven or even nine days after election day because they just don't have them yet. Uh, I'm gonna be transparent. Any information that we receive from, from the counties, we're gonna provide that to the media but those results are gonna be very preliminary and you're gonna see potentially a shift between what some counties put out and what other counties put out because some counties do better in some counties than others. Uh, so there won't be any final election results until as late as June 30th, a week after election day. If it takes that long for Jefferson and Fayette and these big counties to process all their absentee ballots and report those to me uh, for me to certify. Has the process changed in terms of how each county is responsible for counting those absentee ballots? I, I believe normally, correct me if I'm wrong, you have observers that can come in on election day and, and watch that process. How will that unfold in this new environment we find ourselves in? Well, uh, the governor and I were very, were very clear both in our, our agreement and also in the regulation that was promulgated by the State Board of Elections that, that incorporated that agreement that we're not suspending any law unless we're very explicit about it. The General Assembly gave us the authority to suspend a law that we had to, uh, only if we had to, uh, for this election. We were, the governor and I both are very cautious about that. Uh, we don't wanna go around suspending laws willy nilly. So we left everything intact that we could. One example is that by law, uh, campaigns are permitted to have challengers in the room, monitoring the, uh, the processing and counting of ballots. That's to ensure transparency. That's to ensure that people don't steal elections. And, and we didn't change that. And so we gave every campaign uh, the right to name challengers, to 
to monitor election day and also monitor the county. That's a good thing. That's that's transparency. So that's all the same. All we required is that is that uh, CDC guidance be followed, that people be spaced apart, but otherwise we left that completely intact. The only thing that we changed with respect to the processing of ballots is we allowed the counties to begin uh, processing and counting ballots earlier than uh, election night. Simply because if we waited until election night at 6 p.m. to start counting a million absentee ballots, it would take a month to count them all. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. So we allowed the county clerks to begin the process of, of not announcing, but counting the absentee ballots on their machines, not, not producing counts, just running the ballots through the machines. They can later close up the machine and get the count. So even they don't necessarily know what the votes are. They just know that the votes have been run through the machine. We let them start that on June 1st, three weeks before the election, because it would just take that long to run all these absentee ballots through the machine. Uh, so that's another reason why there's going to be a delay in many counties of uh, them reporting their election results is they only have one machine available for processing absentee ballots and they can't close that machine out until they're done. So they're not done until they're done. They're not done until they've received all the final ballots. And so they're not going to have absentee ballot results to announce election. They'll only have in-person results. And if you just announce in-person and then you announce absentee and then the, the numbers change significantly, that'll potentially sow doubt in the absentee process is not appropriate. So I think it'll be maybe 50-50 on counties in terms of how many go ahead and count uh, what they have election night and how many will wait. We don't have a survey back yet of all the counties. We've heard from Jefferson, Fayette, and McCracken. Well, Mr. Secretary, you're certainly a busy man and I just want to applaud you for your innovation, uh, for adapting throughout this process as we've all had to do, uh, but to do so uh, with a statewide election, I know that is no small undertaking and, and just kudos to you and your staff for the work that you've done and also to our county clerks. And I do just want to mention our county clerk who we appreciate so much, Kenny Barger. He was planning to be with us today, but had something come up in his office at the last minute. Uh, but uh, we certainly want Kenny to know that we appreciate him and his staff and all of the work that they're doing uh, for the upcoming election. So why don't we go ahead and just um, close out. If you have any uh, closing thoughts you would like to share with the group, uh, feel free to do so. Well, Ethan, thank you again for this opportunity. Uh, and Kenny, if you're watching, thank you for the great job you've done in Madison County. I uh, just want to remind everybody you've got until uh, midnight tonight to apply for an absentee ballot. That's the safest, most convenient way to vote is to go to GoVoteKY.com and request your absentee ballot. Again, we'll ask you some questions to verify your identity against what we have on file for you on the voter file. Uh, but then we'll send that out to you, get it back to us at your convenience, but no later than June 23rd. If you can get it back to us faster, that's ideal, uh, because the longer it takes us to get these ballots in, the longer it takes us to count them all. So if you know who you're going to vote for, like I do, go ahead and cash your ballot and get it in to us. Again, you've got four convenient ways to vote and I hope that you'll take advantage of one of them. Well, we certainly appreciate your time today. I also want to thank Kentucky Bank. Um, they are our annual sponsor of our policy luncheon series. And Mr. Secretary, perhaps if we weren't in the middle of COVID, we would have you in Richmond in person today talking about this. Uh, but like everyone else, we've had to adapt with our chamber events as well. Uh, but hopefully once things return to normal, we'll be able to see you in Richmond and we look forward to future conversations. Well, thanks. My folks live in Richmond, so uh, I do look forward especially to coming to Richmond and hope to see you all in person as soon as I can. Excellent. Thanks for doing this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care.